Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to uh, do a review and examination of the video quality from the new Canon 5D Mark IV. When the camera was launched, it of course came with a tremendous amount of hype, most of it negative, about uh, the spec list on the camera, and then of course a lot of disappointment from the video crowd when it came to the performance of the 5D Mark IV. The reality is, however, is that a lot of those opinions came before hardly anyone was actually using the camera. And I, I find that photographers tend to have very short memories. I heard a lot and read a lot of uh, conversation tossed about about how that the, the 5D Mark III had been such a, a staple for shooting video and used by videographers and all of this praise for it, when the reality was is that if you can remember back four or five years ago, there was a tremendous amount of drama surrounding the 5D Mark III and uh, complaints of rolling shutter, complaints of it having a, a soft 10 ADP output and not being as sharp as competitors and, you know, all of these things. And not to say that any of those complaints were not completely legitimate. But the reality was is that people, as they do, they make adjustments, they learn how to use a camera to the best of its abilities. And so the end result is years later, people are praising the 5D Mark III as being a great um, kind of hybrid DSLR stills video machine. And so what I want to do today is to really break down the video performance of the 5D Mark IV and hopefully provide some balance to um, all of the drama that's been out there. So to be fair, I do want to start by examining some of the shortcomings of the 5D Mark IV when it comes to the video performance. And uh, they are noted most notably when it comes to the, the way that the, the 4K coverage has been implemented. And of course, there was a huge demand that this camera have 4K coverage. Cam uh, Canon elected when the ADD came out, you know, six or seven months ago to forego having um, 4K coverage on it. And there was a lot of, you know, again, a lot of drama and criticism over that because the a Sony a6300 had launched at a at similar time and it, of course, had 4K coverage and the, the, the Canon didn't. But, of course, since that point, um, people have accepted that limitation and they've learned that it is a really exceptional um, 1080p camera and I use it a lot for my YouTube channel. It produces great footage. Um, the DPAF focus works fantastic. It really does everything that I want it to do. And, and so, and of course, the reality is whether it was necessary or not, um, there were some shortcomings in the Sony a6300 that Sony has decided to already address and have launched um, the Sony a6500. Of course, that's going to leave a number of a6300 customers pretty upset that their camera was only the new and the best for about six months before it was replaced. So that, that's a whole nother matter altogether. But when it comes to the implementation of 4K, consumers wanted it to be there, and of course it is. Howbeit, the first uh, concerns were A, that it, it only came at a limitation of um, 30 frames per second. And so you have a cho choice of 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second, but no 60 frames per second. So that was the first disappointment. And of course, there's nothing you can do about that. That's the limitation that the camera has. But of course, that was compounded further by the fact that it uses a, a basically almost lossless without any kind of real compression at all and thus huge um, um, motion or MJPEG format that is creates huge, and they are huge, um, file sizes. For example, with a 64 uh, gig um, CF card put in this 5D Mark IV, which is what I've got in it right now, it says that I can do about 16 and a half minutes of 4K video. And so um, it uses a ton of space with that. And of course, you can take that footage out of there. You can transcode it into uh, an MP4 format and, you know, at a, a more reasonable, say, um, 75 megabits and... Um, the footage to me, you know, looks about the same. And the reality is, is I don't really have a, f a true 4K monitor around anywhere. And I'm going to have to, to change that um, to edit footage for the future. But uh, the reality is, is that the tech isn't really fully implemented in most consumers' homes either. And so there is certainly a very vocal crowd that wants 4K coverage, 
the reality is, is that a lot of people are not going to use um, 4K at this point. It's a format that while the footage looks good and I've got a um, you know some up uploaded fo footage here you can take a look at just straight out of camera. Footage looks really great um, but it does take up a huge amount of storage space and so it's going to require you know a pretty serious machine for editing all of that. You're probably going to want to transcode it before you do any kind of real edits. So yes there are some very real challenges when it comes to that. Um, and, and then on top of that, um, Canon elected to use a, a cropped portion of the sensor for the 4K coverage, so it doesn't really cover a full frame, um, the full frame of the sensor, and that crop factor is over 1.7 times. So the main challenge with that is that um, if, if you want to shoot wide angle shots, it means you're dealing with a pretty huge crop factor, and of course, Canon elected that its EFS mount lenses, which are designed for our crop sensor, uh, they don't mount on the 5D Mark IV. So that is a, a very real shortcoming. Of course, the kind of crazy thing for Canon when it comes to this is that third-party crop sensor lenses from Sigma or Tamron or Tokina or Samyang or any number of other manufacturers, all of those actually mount on the 5D Mark IV because they don't use an EFS mount, they use an EF mount. And so, kind of, in a, to me, somewhat of a stupid move, Canon cut off its own um, EFS or crop sensor lenses while leaving the door open for third-party lenses to be used. And so, I mean, here's your workaround. If you want to shoot wide angle um, and you don't have you know, a, a Canon lens that's going to work. You can get yourself a third-party crop lens that is going to deal with that crop factor just fine and allow you wide-angle shots. If that's a big deal to you, there's a workout, workaround right there. And of course, one of the main lenses that people are going to throw on there is a lens like the uh, Sigma Art Series 18 to 35 millimeter f1.8. A very nice option for shooting in that way. I find that with my uh, my Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter, 15 millimeters is still reasonably wide, and so for most of what I'm going to do, it still um, will foot the bill for me. Other things beyond that um, is in terms of the, the criticisms is that it does not have an articulating screen and um, which like the ADD does and, and it's fantastic for shooting uh, video with and so I think that was something that they, they probably should have done and I really hope that they do with the 60 uh, Mark II. But uh, here is a pretty cool workaround for that. Let me detail this for a moment. Certainly an articulating screen is very, very handy. And I, I think at this stage Canon is capable of, of building a camera with a robust enough body that can have an articulating screen and still have weather sealing and be rugged and durable. But they elected to not do that. The one thing that is quite a, uh, a salvation, however, in this situation for those of us that um, need to be both in front of the camera and at times behind the camera is that now the uh, the Wi-Fi that is built into the 5D Mark IV and the corresponding Canon app allow you to uh, control the video settings and to control video recording remotely from the app. And so right now I'm using this iPad in which I have a kind of a live feed of what's going on from the camera. And on top of that, more importantly, I can make adjustments to settings right here on the fly. I could do the same thing on my phone and I've used it for monitoring in that way. Uh, but at the same time, not only can I, I make changes to aperture and shutter speed and ISO, but uh, it's also nice, I can, I can change video modes on the fly as well. And so it means that once you're kind of in position and you can you know, get a sense of the lighting of your situation, you have a chance to then actually tweak the settings for your, your capture and so that you can make sure that things are focused in the right way. On top of that, um, you can just touch the screen where you want focus to be. And so in this case, I've got the, you know, the, the face tracker on my face and it does a fantastic job with the DPAF of tracking in that way. Um, and so as long as you have that set up properly, it does a, a fantastic job. So this does to help make up for the lack of an articulating screen and it is a very handy thing for those of us that do what I do. So we've, we've hit on some of the, the main negatives when it comes to video performance, but you know, when I hear people saying very dramatically that all those have been able to do all of this fantastic stuff with the 5D Mark III, they're not gonna be able to do that anymore. <laughs> really, that's kind of ridiculous because the truth of the matter is is that the 5D Mark IV 
does everything that the 5D Mark III did, except for it adds all kinds of functionality to that. Um, when it comes to the 1080p mode, this may be uh, Canon's best 1080p camera yet because it does add on a 60 frame per second 1080p mode. The uh, 1080p uses the full full frame of the sensor. Uh, of course, you do have HDMI out, and while there isn't kind of a, a flat log profile, there are already um, alternative profiles that are there that are flat that you can upload to the camera, and if you want to shoot that way, you can. Um, and so it, it's got all of that. And to be fair, the, um, you know, if you want to go up to 120 frames per second, you're knocked down to 720p and it doesn't look all that fantastic. So, you know, it, it's only to be used in certain circumstances. But the truth of the matter is, is that at 1080, um, either at 24, 30 or 60 frames per second, the footage is it's very superior to that which the 5D Mark III could produce. It's it's much sharper. Of course, this sensor has better dynamic range. It has better um, high ISO performance. And so all of those factors are still in place when you're shooting video with it. But beyond that, of course, Canon has added to the 5D Mark IV its DPAF um, technology, which is fantastic. And, uh, and I've enjoyed it on the 70D and the 80D, and then of course it was introduced on the 1DX Mark II. But this is kind of the first, you know, camera for the masses, um, from full frame from Canon, that has the DPF technology. So DPAF, it allows incredibly accurate um, tracking performance. It does a great job of using video while, during video, doing AF. And just because I get the question sometimes, yes, any autofocusing lens is going to work with DPAF. The STM lenses or the new uh, Nano USM technology, it, it focuses more smoothly, it creates less noise, but you know, if you're like me, I capture my audio separately from my video, and so it's not really a factor for what I do. And so anyway, um, it you know, it autofocuses fantastic and it becomes great for this kind of thing. And, and I can monitor as I am right now on an alternate screen. I can see what's going on, all of that wirelessly. I can make sure that all the settings are right. And so then the ability to just touch that screen wherever you want the camera to focus, the handling is really fantastic for that. And of course, if you're behind the camera, you can just touch the touch screen. But if you're in front of the camera like I am, if you're using a, an app um, on a tablet, or a phone or a computer, you still, if you have a touch screen, you can still utilize the touch screen technology and simply touch where you want it to focus, where you want it to track. And so the addition of all of that, to me, makes the 5D Mark IV a very versatile video performer. And the reality is, is that the footage looks great from it. The 4K footage looks very, very good, although, you know, at that huge file size. And, and I find applications for that. And the other thing that as a part of that 4K coverage is that the, the screen grab um, or being able to just um, pull out JPEGs at eight megabytes is, is quite handy. And I've got some beautiful shots that I've pulled out of that. And there's certainly some handy applications for that. Perhaps um, for wedding shooters, you know, the moment of the kiss or at some key moment where, you know, you're wanting to capture just that that perfect second, you can scroll through that and, and pull a still out of there that really looks quite good. And, uh, and so, you know, that's an added benefit. And so, yes, the Canon 5D Mark IV, it does have shortcomings when it comes to its video performance. And, uh, but at the same time, it's got huge amounts of improvement to its video as well. And the truth of the matter is, as a 5D Mark IV shooter, I'm finding that I, I'm enjoying the video performance. And I wasn't using my full frame cameras at all for my channel here. I was sticking with the 80D um, or the 70D before that, but I haven't been using those cameras nearly as much because I really do enjoy um, what the 5D Mark IV brings to the table in terms of the footage and the functionality. One of the things that I uh, dealt with with the 70D was pretty bad moray. And so um, I'm going to do a little bit of a comparison here and let's see how the 5D Mark IV is handling um, the, the pattern noise that's created by repeating patterns, for example, in fabrics. 
So as kind of a torture test, I'm uh, wearing a shirt that I know creates a very bad amore pattern, um, kind of that pattern noise as there is movement across the sheen of the fabric, and that, re that repeating pattern in the uh, certain kinds of fabrics in particular, they're the most notorious for it, they'll create uh, that kind of rippling green or purple effect. And that right there is why Canon included an AA filter on the 5D Mark IV. A lot of people have been upset by that. But as you can see in the video footage, that AA filter is doing a fantastic job of eliminating the moray patterning. Um, and so I think that really what needs to be praised here is that Canon has managed to combine very sharp footage, which the 1080p footage out of the 5D Mark IV is excellent, best probably that Canon has ever produced, while providing the best elimination of the kind of the pattern, repeating pattern noise that I have, I've seen out of a Canon camera. If you step back and you take a, a more objective look at the performance of the 5D Mark IV when it comes to its all-around video performance, it, it's actually a little bit more nuanced than what some of the early coverage has made it out to be. The reality is, is that you still have the ability to um, mod monitor uh, audio through a headphone jack. You still have HDMI out, although the HDMI out is uh, limited to 1080p. Um, of course, there are some real shortcomings when it comes to the 4K video production. But at the same time, if you will work within the limitations of it, you can get some fantastic looking footage out of the 5D Mark IV. It has great 1080p footage, and the reality is, is that there isn't anything out there yet that's really as good as Canon's DPAF um, combined with the touchscreen. And uh, even people that are, you know, serious video shooters that are used to using, you know, more dedicated video rigs, not DSLRs, they love the DPF technology, they love the face tracking, they love being able to touch, to pull or rack focus. Um, you know, it, it's pretty great. And so the truth of the matter is, is that the 5D Mark IV is still, it's still an excellent hybrid stills and video camera. It's just that maybe uh, Canon has skewed uh, some of its video features towards its actual cinema line. And that, that, is, that has created some ire. There's people that feel that they're being shoved towards um, a, a cinema series camera when they wanted to do it all with a DSLR. At the same time, a lot of people would say that if video is your priority, you need to buy the best tools for the job. And a DSLR really has never been the best tool for the job. It's just that they're capable of producing great footage. Um, how be it with, you know, some extra work in acquiring that footage. So at the end of the day, I'm finding it hard to be irate about the, uh, the 5D Mark IV footage. Uh, in fact, the, the one thing that I think has impacted me the most is that I am disappointed by the huge file size of that uh, Motion JPEG um, video codec. And I really wish that there was an MP4 option built into the camera. Unfortunately, that's probably not going to happen. But uh, really, that is my only true objection. I would have liked to have seen the articulating screen on it, um, you know, but I understand why they didn't implement it. I do hope that that changes in the future. But I have, I have found the workaround of using a, a wireless app um, through my tablet or my phone to be a, a pretty great substitute for that. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you haven't already, you can follow me down below on social media. There's a full playlist of where I've been covering pretty much every aspect of the 5D Mark IV, and I'm going to be bringing you a final verdict that covers the just my opinion of having used it for a, a month and a half, as well as a, little, a few more observations on the autofocus and aspects feature list of the camera, and that'll be coming in another week or so. Thanks for watching today. Have a great day.